Welcome everyone, and as you just heard, uh, this session will be recorded. Just want to give everyone advance notice. Uh, the panelists are already aware. Um, the attendees, uh, we will not hear you on audio, but we will have ability to chat with you and also for you to use the, uh, the Q&A feature uh, to ask questions to the panelists. Uh, if anything comes up during the presentation. I'd like to first introduce myself. My name is Judy Serenzia. I am uh, the FACE Consortium Program Director from the Open Group. And I would like to welcome all of you today uh, to the FACE Contract Guide webinar. Uh, we appreciate your interest in learning more about uh, using the FACE Contract Guide. And uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I am going to run through uh, some of the webinar features quickly. Uh, we do have a chat window that some of you have already found and have been using. Uh, this you can use to chat amongst yourselves with any of the other participants that are here listed on the attendee list. Uh, you have a, an option to choose all panelists, all participants, or just an individual that you may want to chat back and forth with. Uh, there is also a Q&A feature uh, that you can use to type in questions during any particular slide presentation. I will pause after uh, each slide to make sure that if there are any questions in the chat window that we ask the relevant speaker the question so that we can get those questions answered live, uh, not save them uh, for the end of the presentation. And with that, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, Gabriel Flores from Northrop Grumman. He is the FACE Consortium Business Strategy Subcommittee lead. Uh, and then we also have two co-leads from the Business Strategy Subcommittee, Jason York representing U.S. Army Amerdeck and Deborah Moradian representing NAVAIR. I'm going to start things off with a quick introduction uh, to the FACE Consortium, the FACE Initiative, some of the, the benefits to government and industry for using the, uh, the FACE approach. And then we'll turn things over to the panelists to give you more information and education about the FACE contract guide, uh, its intended purpose, and how to maximize being able to use it. Okay. So what is the future airborne capability environment? Uh, the future airborne capability environment is a government industry software standard and business strategy uh, designed to uh, develop to acquire affordable software systems, rapidly integrate portable capabilities across global defense programs, not just domestic, and attract innovation and deploy it quickly and affordably. Uh, the software standard and business strategy are developed through industry and government collaboration via the Open Group FACE Consortium. The benefits that we found uh, for government users is that uh, the FACE approach does fit in quite nicely with better buying power. We have a lot of the same tenets, including increasing competition, achieving affordability, and controlling life cycle costs of multiple programs. Uh, we also look to incentivize productivity and innovation in both industry and government, and reduce software development times, again, to achieve affordability. Uh, through modularity and portability. Uh, we also look at cross-platform decision-making, uh, build it once, use it multiple times, focusing very much on the ability to reuse applications across multiple platforms without having any cross-platform dependencies, uh, eliminating the need to invest multiple times to develop the same capability over and over, and enabling integration of cross-platform requirements. So this is all... Um, fits right in with better buying power. The cross-platform decision-making is something new uh, for um, government um, investment approaches, but it's something that can be achieved uh, by using uh, standards such as the, the FACE technical standard and the business approach we're putting together. We've also put together uh, FACE industry benefits, uh, industry benefits by uh, being able to enable new markets, uh, creating software-centric market opportunities so that there are more market niches that industry can go into with their existing product lines. Uh, it also enables penetration of formerly closed platforms where if uh, one uh, prime contractor uh, developed the entire software stack, there wasn't really room for the uh, 
some of the smaller vendors or innovative vendors to access uh, where their areas of expertise happen to be. Um, it provides opportunity for software applicability to multiple aircraft types as well. Um, it also uh, provides a way for industry to lower their cost of doing business. Uh, common standards uh, will lower cost and reduce uh, schedule risks. Uh, standardization of the software interfaces allows for rapid development of capabilities because the interfaces are already well known. And reusing uh, software application does enable integrators to optimize platform performance. Just a little bit about the FACE Consortium. Uh, we have uh, been very busy developing several work products to date. Uh, we have, um, back in J January of 2012, we released edition 1.0 of the FACE technical standard. Uh, there were some um, corrections, update enhancements to the, that that we put together through a technical core agendum, uh, which uh, was rolled out as FACE technical standard edition 1.1. And then uh, FACE Technical Standard Edition 2.0 uh, and 2.1. FACE Technical Standard Edition 1.0 focused more on the technical interfaces. Uh, editions 2.0 and 2.1 introduced the concept of uh, data model and syntactic interfaces. Uh, we're evolving Edition 3.0 to represent syntactic and semantic interfaces as well. So we're getting more and more detail, uh, more and more ability to share and communicate across uh, different standards, across different communities, as well as within the avionics community. Uh, we've also put together reference implementation guides uh, to uh, describe best practices for how to use the technical standard. And then data model, uh, conformance documents, uh, conformance verification matrix as we go through the uh, verification portion of the conformance program, uh, face business guide version one, uh, the FACE contract guide, which you're going to be hearing more about in just a few minutes, and then information on the library infrastructure where, where we will store um, our set of uh, FACE conformant software products uh, in a registry where uh, folks can find uh, what has been through the FACE conformance program, certified as FACE conformant and available to reuse. Uh, so we're looking, we're very excited about the, the level of effort that we've put in and uh, the fact that we are getting ready, ready for business uh, to enable uh, contracts to be written that have face requirements for face conformance software and information for vendors to be able to provide how they are going to supply face conformance software products as well. Uh, you can download any of these documents for free. They're globally and freely available uh, from the opengroup.org slash face web, web page. Uh, just go to opengroup.org slash face slash information and you'll find a list of the documents available uh, with links uh, to get each of them individually. Any questions so far? Okay, so with that, I'm going to go on mute and hand things over to Gabriel Flores, our first presenter. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, as Judy uh, introduced me, I'm Gabriel Flores of North Grumman, uh, the FACE uh, Business Strategy Subcommittee Chair. Now, the FACE Contract Guide was published in 2014, and uh, be uh, before that, uh, as you saw the, the number of documents, there are a number of face technical doc documents that were published and made available, and we had teams working on the, the technical aspects of uh, the face standard. But what we found what was missing was uh, actually the, the practical how to get the face requirements into a solicitation and uh, resulting contract. And we would often get a lot of questions from uh, from um, uh, both government and, and industry on, on how, how to do this. And as it was a very important part of the consortium to address the, the business aspects of the FACE standard, uh, it was decided that the FACE contract guide w would, would really solve that, um, uh, that, that part, right? And so really the FACE contract guide came about of, uh, out of that, and it's really the how to get requir FACE requirements into the solicitation resulting contract, right? And so, uh, it provides guidance on the language that you could directly insert into solicitations and contracts. Now, none of it is mandatory and is meant to be tailor 
tailorable to the program and program uh, uh, the program manager um, specific needs. Um, you can see. It was uh, produced by the consortium with participants that included uh, the U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and uh, industry participants. Uh, and it will apply to all editions of the FACE technical standard, uh, including 1.0, uh, 2.0, 2.1, and any future uh, editions that will be released in the future. As mentioned, it, it, it provides table language that you could use for solicitations. Uh, and uh, it highly leverages the, uh, the DOD OSA contract guidebook for program managers. We, we actually had started looking at that because we didn't want to repeat a lot of the, the concepts that are in that guidebook, but we just wanted to augment it that was, uh, that was specific for FACE. Uh, and it's important to note that this doesn't necessarily change any procurement process or requirements. It's just really adding clarity specific for FACE requirements. Okay, next. I do have one question that came in uh, that I'm going to put forth to the panelists before we move on. Um, so what is the real motivation behind FACE? Uh, the benefits that have been mentioned are generic benefits which you can achieve by better architecture and design. Um, I'll open that up to our, our three panelists and then I can see if I can chime in at the end with some more specific information. I can try to take a hack at that, Judy. Okay, go ahead, uh, this is Deb Meradian. Um, I believe one of the uh, one of the primary goals, um, at least from the NAVAIR standpoint, was there's a lot of guidance as to open architectures, uh, but it was it was guidance in generalities. And the the face approach is one implementation of open architecture, and one what we would call a technical reference framework, which we thought was needed. Okay, uh, Gabriel, Jason, any commentary? John Bowling? Sure, Judy, this is Jason. So uh, FACE really, or the FACE approach really promotes portability. And we do that through uh, well-defined open interfaces. So uh, I, I, I agree, there, there's other viable approaches uh, out there, but what we're trying to do is standardize across the services and across the industry to have one approach with uh, a layered architecture with well-defined interfaces between the segments. If I may add to that, uh, I would say that we've all recognized that we built a lot of tightly coupled systems that were necessary to meet performance on the hardware of the era, but hardware is now outpacing the capability of our software writers. So we wanted to come up with an approach that would allow us to pursue abstraction in our software in the avionics arena and elsewhere in order to uh, have an organized approach to it that was not you know, one vendor's solution, but to have a, a vendor independent set of standards such that as we go from tightly coupled systems to more abstracted systems, we do it in a controlled and, and shared way so that there's a much better chance for us to do reuse between various vendors and uh, programs. Thank you, everyone. I will uh, move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so who's the target audience for the contract guide? Uh, it's really uh, both for government and industry, right? So any uh, acquisition team that has uh, open system architecture requirements and specifically uh, face requirements that they want to put in their solicitation and, and contract, it's really geared toward them. So the team that would maybe include uh, both engineering, logistics, contracts folks, legal, et cetera. Right? Uh, and it's also uh, equally useful for uh, industry teams that are responding to such a solicitation so they could understand uh, a lot of the motivation behind uh, the language that would go into uh, of such documents. Next chart. 
the layout of the document is as such. It starts off with uh, an introduction, kind of uh, describing what the document is uh, and its goals. And then it goes into the main section of, of the recommended uh, tailable language for uh, the specific uh, aspects of a solicitation and contract. Right? It includes specific language for a uh, statement of work, a technical specification, uh, section L, instructions, conditions, and notices to, officer, uh, to offers. Uh, section M, where it contains the evaluation factors, and uh, Section H, uh, special contract requirements. And in the, in the appendix, you have a, a, an overview of the face conformance program, as well as uh, standard sigils, uh, so, some uh, uh, amendments you may want to consider for uh, standard sigils that it would include face requirements. Uh, and then as well as a template for both OSMP and the software architecture description. And throughout the document, you'll find uh, what we call these commentary boxes that provide uh, additional rationale information and information on uh, various topics throughout the document. So we'll have the tailable language in there, and then we'll have a commentary box to kind of explain our rationale and our thinking behind uh, why you may or may not want to include that language and, what, and, and how you may want to tailor it. For your specific needs. Okay, next chart. Yeah. And for some uh, uh, specific guidance that it provides, um, uh, so, some uh, examples here is that uh, it's important to know, you know, which base technical standard edition that you'll want to adhere to, whether it's the 1.0, 2.0, or 2.1. Right, you definitely want to put that into your solicitation and or contract. Uh, some additional things to consider is uh, defining what specific capabilities that you that you're requiring to have face conformance. Right. Uh, another aspect to consider uh, that that's it, that we mentioned in the the contract guide is uh, the del deliverables and artifacts. Right. Uh, what which deliverables and artifacts do you need to ensure portability, reuse? throughout the whole program life cycle, right? And what are the appropriate rights that you want to consider to have that? Right. Uh, as well as uh, what you'll want to, in the end is the, the, uh, the base conformance certifications. Once they're attained, you'll want that to be delivered for the program. So these are just a couple of examples that uh, uh, of some things that the, the contract guide uh, uh, provides. Next chart. And I think from here, uh, Jason? Yes. All right, thanks, Gabriel. So uh, what I want to do with this slide is talk about uh, three specific areas that the contract guide doesn't fully address. And the reason that the contract guide doesn't fully address these is because the FACE approach uh, does, does not fully address all of these three areas which this has led to some misconceptions that, uh, that the consortium, you know, has battled. So I want to take the opportunity to kind of dispel some of these misperceptions. The first one is in uh, data rights. So, uh, you know, you, you've probably heard, oh, the, the FACE approach requires unlimited data rights or, or minimum GPR. That is absolutely not the case. Uh, the rights in technical data and computer software, we are not adding any uh, additional requirements on data rights. In fact, the tech standard uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't specify any of the uh, data rights uh, in it at all. Uh, one thing that we are pushing in the contract guide is to look at your specific uh, solicitation, what you're trying to acquire, talk to your legal counsel, and figure out what, uh, what rights you do need to make sure that you're successful. Uh, when we talk about the FACE approach, we're talking about well-defined open interfaces between the segments. And we, uh, as, a, as a consortium and you know, the, the FACE approach, uh, we uh, support software vendors uh, protecting their intellectual property. So that, that is one of the misconceptions that we want to dispel here. So we are, we are not increasing uh, the amount of data rights. Actually, we're not changing it at all, and we're, we're not trying to get the intellectual property from the vendors. We're allowing them to protect it. Uh, we're, we're just really promoting portability. And uh, 
uh, like I said, we, we really emphasize in the contract guide to go seek out uh, your legal advice on your specific procurement and, and figure out exactly what rights you need and what can you, you can afford. Uh, the, the second uh, misconception is, is about performance. I've, I've heard people say, oh, well, if your face can form it, uh, you're guaranteed performance. Oh, well, uh, on the other hand, if, if you're following the face approach, uh, you can't achieve performance, which, which is not true at all. Uh, functionality and performance are actually not specified or discussed in the tech standard or the contract guide does not guarantee functionality and performance, and it does not prohibit functionality and performance. Uh, you still have to go through your, your standard uh, you know, testing cycle and, and in, ensure what you're acquiring does perform as the vendor uh, claims it does. And the, uh, the, the last one that, that's caused a misconception, a lot like performance, is airworthiness. Uh, the, uh, the face tech standard and the contract guide uh, does not address airworthiness. And I've heard people say, uh, oh, if you're following the face approach, you're guaranteeing airworthiness uh, qualification, or, oh, if you're following the face approach, you, you can't qualify, which is not true at all. Uh, we decided early on in the uh, consortium not to address airworthiness uh, as a whole. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of a, a large thing to tackle. So uh, the Army, uh, specifically AMARDEC, uh, Software Engineering Directorate, also aligned with our Aviation Engin Engineering Directorate, which is the Army's uh, Airworthiness Certification Authority, developed a, uh, a document, Developer's Requirements Guide for Airworthy Reusable Face Units of Conformance. Uh, that is available. Uh, based on uh, request. That is actually a distro A document. So uh, if, if any of the uh, attendees would like a copy of that, uh, please let me know and I will make sure that we get you a copy of that. Like I said, that is uh, distro A. Okay, Jason, before we move to the next slide, we do have a question from one of the attendees uh, that I'll again ask uh, each of the panelists. Does it cost more to do face? And Jason, we'll start with you since you're the the, the current speaker. So, uh, if you're talking life cycle cost and you're talking um, cross platforms and being able to use this to port it to other platforms, I'm going to say the answer is no. What you what you need to do is is go and look and what you're trying to procure and see if if that is a capability that's a good candidate to follow the face approach to be used uh, cross-platform. Uh, you know, maybe cross-platform in the services and maybe, you know, there could be cost sharing uh, amongst the services, you know, as well. Any, any time uh, that you can do cost sharing to multiple platforms, it's going to save you in the life cycle cost. Uh, on, on the second hand, if you are, if you're just trying to procure a capability in a stovepipe manner, they, it is, it is very likely. It is it has not been proven, but it is likely it is going to be slightly more expensive to acquire a face conformant product or a capability enabled by face conformant software, just just because you are taking into account uh, kind of a software product line mentality. You are trying to prepare, you know, for that portability to be used on other platforms. Okay, Deb, uh, Gabriel, John Bowling, do you have uh, more to add? Yes, uh, Gabriel. Yeah, I, I would second to what Jason said. Um, uh, if, if you're developing a face or a, a capability with with face requirements in a stovepipe manner, um, it, it would probably be the same, if not a little bit more, uh, cost as, as Jason said. Um, now it, would, it wouldn't be a whole lot more, but it would certainly be at, uh, at least the same or, or a little bit more. Um, and really, again, with face, face, the cost savings really comes in the, the, the ability to reuse these capabilities on multiple platforms. Okay. 
And I would uh, I would piggyback onto that that um, like Jason said, if you're doing it, if you're used to doing things in a stovepipe manner, you don't care whether uh, you're not thinking about that next integration, then you know face is going to cost you could cost you a little bit more because you do have the element of the conformance testing. Um, but if you're thinking ahead and you're getting that capability with the face common operating environment, that's going to make your next integration. Uh, you're going to be able to take advantage of a previously developed component. The integration should be easier. So in that way, you're going to save money over the life cycle. And as far as, you know, a current software development project using your current methods and now you're implementing the face technical standard, and, uh, it, you know, there's going to be a learning curve to do that. And it's just, it's going to depend on how closely you are currently aligned to, you know, the modularization and use of, uh, of the open um, interfaces in the face technical standard. And this is uh, Gabriel again. Uh, I think one important thing that Deb mentioned was the integration aspect. So even if you were to develop a capability in the stovepipe manner, uh, what face will help you even down the line if you need to replace that capability with a you know a, a tech update or improvement to that capability. The integration is a lot easier. So even though you know you're still quite just for that single platform, you could save still over the over the life cycle of that single platform based on the integration aspect of uh, of tech updates. Okay, I have two other questions that came in the chat window. Uh, one about. Um, whether or not FACE includes a fully defined data dictionary and associated data library uh, that John Bowling uh, provided information. Uh, FACE does provide a data model that is uh, compatible with the UCS data model. We're looking at uh, keeping those two efforts aligned. Uh, there is a shared data model that's available on the, uh, the U.S. server that's publicly available. If you go to that uh, www.opengroup.org slash face slash information site, uh, you should be able to find a link there for uh, face shared data model edition 2.0 and edition 2.1 that correspond to the face technical standard. Uh, we are working on aligning uh, the data dictionary with those definitions that are in the, the SAE AS4 UCS committee uh, data dictionary, but that alignment has not yet been completed. Um, we also have a question, uh, an offer to share experience regarding setting up a government enterprise bus where different government entities must export some business services. Um, Mohammed, I would like to table that until the end of the presentation, let folks get through the content, and then we'll open that, that particular question up for discussion. And uh, if we've answered everyone else's questions uh, sufficiently, we'll move on to the next slide. Otherwise, either just put a quick chat in the window or in the QA window, and uh, we'll keep the dialogue going until we get folks satisfied that their answers are, or their questions have been addressed. Okay, I'm not seeing any dialogue. So we will move on to the next slide. Okay, Jason, go ahead. Sure. So the uh, the path forward. Ho hopefully, uh, we've kind of piqued your interest on the contract guide. Uh, now, now you need to go get a copy and, uh, and and read it for yourself and and see how you can leverage that. Uh, as Judy mentioned earlier, uh, that that's actually available uh, to download free of charge. There's actually the the open group um, web link. Uh, so you, you can go in and uh, log on, register, download that for free. And what we recommend is share the share the contract guide with your program managers, your contracting specialists, your engineers, and your other procurement support. Uh, the contract guide was was written for those folks, primarily the acquiring program manager and, and his staff. Um, as Gabriel mentioned, uh, we actually have. Uh, sample language in there that you can reuse and tailor for your specific procurement. This, this allows uh, you, if you have a uh, procurement with face requirements, it allows you not to start from scratch. You've got some uh, example language to use, and uh, in addition, we have some uh, 
gray commentary boxes that kind of support why the language is what it is that, that we're recommending. So this, this is a great uh, uh, asset for an acquiring program manager. And uh, the, uh, the points of contact, uh, we have uh, Gabriel from industry, Deb from the Navy, and, and myself from the Army. Uh, if you have any questions, if you, if you would like a, a deep dive in on anything, please reach out and uh, contact us. We'd, we'd be more than happy to engage with you. Okay, so with that, we've completed the main portion of the webinar. Uh, are there any general questions about what you've heard today or any specific questions you may have uh, having glanced through the contract guide where you may need some more specific information on uh, how to use uh, particular aspects of it, best practices, anything like that? We'll open up the, uh, the QA panel and uh, the chat panel if you want to type anything in quickly uh, to keep dialogue going. Uh, otherwise, we'll move on to um, the uh, offer from uh, Mohammed Adlani. I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, he did put a chat to all participants. Okay, we do have one other question. Are there any non-GOD users of FACE? Uh, Jason, I'll, uh, Jason and Deb, I'll lob this over to you first. I, I know of some who are considering it. I don't know if we could actually call them users, but uh, you and government-to-government -government conversations may have more information. I've heard of uh, one of our industry representatives who were pitching the idea of using space for um, a petroleum application. So yes, I think there will be non dod users. There um, are certainly applications of space in, as an airborne um, as an avionics in the commercial uh, aviation industry, many of the uh, functionality that commercial aircraft have can be developed to be phase conformant and used uh, in our military platform. So we definitely see um, that market. Um, I kind of focused on one that was not aviation related to start the conversation because you know, we see aspects of that as well. I also know that some in the automotive industry are looking at the software stack, the segment structure, the um, different APIs that are at each of the uh, segment layers, and particularly the, um, the data model concept. Uh, having a set of uh, rules of construction, OCL constraints, and a common data dictionary enables uh, external adjacent markets to uh, build data models and components that need to communicate information to, to from, and through those data model interfaces uh, to um, entities that may or may not be avionics related. So we're looking at the, the data architecture, the constructs, the data dictionary, rules of constructing actual data model basis elements as a, as a way to expand into adjacent uh, some DOD, some non-DOD markets, as well as avionics for both military and commercial applications. And if anyone here on the call is uh, interested in learning more how to get involved in the work of the FACE Consortium, uh, we do have certain criteria uh, for uh, U.S. persons from U.S. companies just because of the, the nature of the, uh, the application that we're working on. Uh, but do send an email to ogface-admin at opengroup.org, and I can put that in the, ch in the chat window at well to all participants uh, so that um, if you're interested and want to get more involved, want to learn more, we can give you the information, put you in touch with the appropriate points of contact. Okay, we have another question. How does the commercial avionics market encourage reuse of software? I'm going to go out on a limb, and uh, I know that some of our, our industry participants 
do have product line architectures as well uh, that uh, they've put in by design to be able to reuse internally so that they are uh, developing once, being able to reuse, being able to save money on research, development, test, and evaluation. I don't know how much crosstalk there is within industry organizations on the commercial side versus the government side, uh, but um, looking at a product line structure in the commercial avionics marketplace uh, might be a good first step toward being able to reuse software. How do you encourage someone to reuse software uh, is, is basically showing them the benefits of doing it versus the, the risk and cost of not. Um, and with that, I'll get off the stage and hand the microphone over to those in industry who know more about the concept than I do. Uh, Gabriel, I will start with you if you want to address that question. Yeah. Deb, can you repeat that question? So it's how does the commercial avionics market encourage reuse of software? I know, you know, there are industry or internal benefits to reusing software, you know, within within the company. Uh, you know, like just as Deb, uh, Judy had mentioned, uh, you know, creating software product lines and being able to use, uh, you know, a set of software uh, for for multiple applications on different platforms. Uh, and so, so there are there are there are benefits internally for that. Yeah, I also, I also, John, just a second, I also received a, a chat from one of our um, FACE industry members uh, pointing out that the commercial avionics industry has created the Airing 653 standard, which is now a standard in almost every new commercial aircraft. Uh, the FACE technical solution has also adopted Airing 653 as part of their solution as well. Uh, so there is some, some crosstalk among uh, commercial and military applications. Um, I don't know if developing Airing 653 is a way to encourage reuse of software, but it is an example of where it's been where it's been done. Go ahead, John. Well, if I may, once a vendor has a an FAA approved, uh, for instance, a DO 178 approved uh, product, they are more than happy to put it on other systems, and it reduces their recertification load when they put it on the next system. By also using FACE, they can reduce their integration workload and benefit even further. And it also allows them to put it into places where they haven't been before by having a vendor neutral environment. So there are a lot of uh, things that uh, the commercial avionics market is seeing as a potential uh, boon for their business. If they produce the best module that does X, they might be able to put it in more places. Yeah, that, that's a good answer, John. And uh, just to pile on a little bit to that, uh, I want to remind everybody that you know DO 178C is uh, is civilian guidance. Uh, what it, it's out there, and, and what we've seen is an advisory circular that came out a few years ago, uh, FAA 20-148, which talks about reusable software components. This this is hitting on exactly what John was just discussing. Uh, it's looking at reusing the, soft, the software and the artifacts uh, of the software, which can be test reports, any type of documentation, and uh, it established when it goes through a system cert, it establishes a pedigree for that software, meaning that that software has a pedigree, so when it's used uh, in the future, uh, you actually get some airworthiness qualification uh, advantages for that. So uh, the FAA has recognized this, and they're promoting uh, the uh, the idea, you know, with, with some with this particular advisory circular. And if I may add back onto that, uh, our airworthiness process also appreciates pedigrees and artifacts in uh, certifying things on a new platform. So it's a win-win if you can simplify your process and take advantage of prior work.
Okay, so another chat from a, a FACE Consortium member. Um, in addition to airing 653 standard, um, the FACE technical standard also includes over 100 commercial avionics standards beyond airing 653. So it does appear like uh, the commercial avionics market is already reusing software, or at least using and developing standards to encourage um, developing software that is reusable. So this is good information. I appreciate the dialogue and the crosstalk. Okay, so there's one other question that came in for the panelists. Okay, this is a challenging question uh, that this particular person receives from the top manager in the EA world where a lot of other frameworks are released. The question is why use FACE and not something else? Uh, so for avionics applications, we'll, we'll narrow it down to that particular technical space. Uh, I'll turn things over to Deb, Gabriel, Jason, and John uh, to get U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force perspective as well as uh, industry perspective on why use FACE and not something else for the solution. I can, I can give a specific example, um, Army related. PEO Aviation a few years ago selected the FACE approach and the FACE technical standard as the common operating environment, specifically the real-time safety critical embedded computing environment for aviation. So if you are a software vendor uh, going to develop uh, you know, software for uh, Army Aviation, uh, if, if it qualifies for, to be reused across platforms, you need to follow the FACE approach to be successful. If I can give an Air Force perspective, uh, if you have good tools in your toolbox, you don't use each one every time you choose the tool that's perfect for your situation. FACE provides the opportunity for security profile, uh, safety profile, and general purpose profile. You have to choose what works in your particular system. You may choose uh, FACE, you may choose something else, but you want to understand what you have and then use the best tool for your problem. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You know, I think, so, uh, uh, you know, no, this is Gabriel. Uh, another benefit too is the is the fact that um, the face approach has a, a really good defined conformance program, right? Um, and and really understanding, uh, you know, how you conform to the technical standard is a very important aspect to to ensure that you're getting you're, you're adhering to the standard. Uh, uh, additionally. Uh, I think we recognize that there are there are lots of uh, standards out there, and there have been pre uh, lots of attempts to do it. But w one thing that you know this consortium uh, ha ha made an emphasis is was addressing the business aspects as well, and so really having to find uh, that um, uh, addressing things like the, con the, what, the things that are addressed in the contract guide. We have the business guide, and we have this conformance program. So not just all the technical aspects, but a lot of the business aspects are are defined uh, and addressed within the face approach, and that uh, kind of gives a, a good overall um, um, uh, something to base uh, going on the standard for both industry and government. Okay. Any other uh, any other comments from our panelists? on that particular topic. Okay, so the last question that we received in the chat uh, was uh, an offer to share uh, experience regarding setting up um, enterprise bus where different gov government industries must export some business services and wanted to know how FACE may leverage such an initiative. Um, at this point, I don't know if we can answer this question on the fly. I think we'd want to do some due diligence uh, and some investigating. 
so I'm going to put my my email in the in the chat if you want to uh, send the information to to me at OG Face Admin, and uh, we can do some investigating and then uh, set up a an email dialogue correspondence uh, and take it from there. I don't think this is something that we can we can do due diligence to and and not give a, a complete and thorough answer if we're just coming up with something in a in a five minute time to think about it. Plus we don't have the opportunity to chat with you. It's a one way. You get to hear us, you we don't get to hear you back. So uh it may be something that we can also set up a webinar for future or WebEx uh with uh, dialogue open to all participants for future discussion once we get more information. Okay, here's another question. Um, are you planning to address how to contract for conformance testing and how to access the registry repository? Uh, so contract for conformance testing, I can't speak to. Uh, how to access the registry repository. Uh, accessing the registry repository uh, is a publicly available tool. We have a face conformance workflow tool. Uh, where the registry of face conformance products will reside. Um, I believe contracting for conformance testing is an individual contract between a software supplier and the verification authority that they choose, and then the certification authority, once they, they get to the point where they are ready to certify their product, um, agree to the terms of the trademark license agreement for the certification mark, and then list their certified conformant FACE software in the FACE registry. Uh, the, any repository uh, would be owned by software suppliers. That's not something that would be publicly accessible, but the FACE registry is a public listing of uh, software units of conformance, software products, components that are um, certified as face conformant and available for folks to peruse and uh, reuse, consider putting on various contracts to, to build their, their various systems. And uh, Deb, Gabriel, Jason, do you have more to add for that particular question? So I'm, I know that the uh, Army has set up a face verification authority. It's uh, one of three uh, verification authorities that's set up, uh, you know, right now. That's actually at the Software Engineering Director at Redstone Arsenal in uh, Huntsville. And uh, our intention in what we've been working with PEO Aviation uh, with is acquiring program managers are encouraged to use the Army face verification authority to uh, qualify uh, and, and certify, or excuse me, verify uh, face conformance. And on the piece about addressing how to contract for conformance testing, the contract guide includes um, a brief overview of the conformance verification process that's been set up. Um, it talks about important things to include in the contract guide, such as which version of the technical standard are you going to be conformant to, which version of the conformance test suite, and some of those factors will most likely be, be determined during contract negotiations. I mean, you can send out a baseline in an RFP, but knowing how the government acquisition process can be uh, lengthy, um, you know, we might have a new version of the technical standard out, we might have a new version of the, of the con uh, conformance test suite. So those are some negotiations that will happen perhaps after contract award. Um, also a question that often comes up is, you know, can I bid on a project if I'm not yet conformant? And, and yes, um, we, we do address that in the contract guide where, um, you know, the, the, you would, you would put in, uh, gateways basically where you would want to be monitoring uh, the conformance of the developed software and and of course the final delivery would have to be conformant. I hope that answers the question there. As far as the actual um, the conformance verification testing which you would be doing with a VA and then the final step is going through a CA, that is a different 
uh, contractual process that's going to be between the software developer or the software supplier and the VA, and then, of course, between the, the software supplier and the CA. So that is not in, in the contract guide. The process is mentioned, but not that contracting process. Yeah, this is Gabriel. I, I second what, what Judy said. In, in the contract guide, we do uh, address uh, the, the, the conformance testing in the sense of the process and what you want to include in your um, software development plan uh, and, and how you want to address the verification process. And so in that sense, that conformance would be part of that verification process. Um, and as far as accessing the registry and repository, we, we, we do address that, you know, if um, that if there are capabilities that may be available within, or if there's some face units of conformance that may be available for your specific program or that you may want, that you could potentially uh, um, look at the re registry or ha have a vendor offer something that's within the registry and see what's available uh, to offer for that program. So we, we do address it in the sense that the, reg the registry is available uh, for to to see what capabilities are, are are available as part of the program. Okay. Any other comments from the panelists on that particular topic? Okay. So we have uh, a, one low hanging fruit question that I will address. Uh, just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded. Uh, it will be available for download in the next uh, day or two. And for all of you who have uh, registered here, we do have your email addresses available. We can send you uh, the, the location of the link when it's available. And then uh, one other question here. Um, are newer versions of the FACE standard backward compatible to older versions? I'm going to start off by saying yes and no and then uh, turn this over to uh, other panelists for more embellishment if needed. Um, edition 3.0 is currently being worked right now, and uh, we have nine technical subcommittees uh, working various aspects, uh, various portions of the, that, that version of the FACE technical standard. Each one of those subcommittees has a backward compatibility matrix that they are looking on, working on to ensure that their portions of the technical standard for edition 3.0 will be backward compatible with editions 2.1, 2.0, and 1.1. Um, as far as 2.0 uh, being backward compatible with 1.0 and 1.1, uh, there is some backward compatibility, but it is not complete. Uh, the technical working group has realized that uh, that could be an issue moving forward, especially if a uh, software supplier uh, is building software to become certified face conformant to one edition. They don't want to undo that conformance by making their software product combat compatible to a later edition. So the, the technical working group is uh, working hard on making sure that the current edition under development, edition 3.0, will be backward compatible with the ones that have already been published, and uh, then we will move forward with keeping future versions of the FACE technical standard backward compatible from that point on. And I believed I, I skipped a question about from DCS. Uh, has anyone looked at two-face implementations and the resulting inconsistencies and conflicts and what, if anything, has been done to correct those disconnects? So we have about six minutes left in our webinar. I'm looking for uh, Jason, John, Gabriel, uh, if you want to take a stab at answering that question, if you know of any FACE implementations that have been looked at and if there are inconsistencies among them. Sure, Judy. This is Jason. Uh, for a little bit over the last five years uh, on our AMARDEC aviation science and technology efforts, we've been doing exactly this. We've actually uh, built a system called ARIES, Avionics Reference Embedded System, that actually contains four different face environments. 
Uh, it spans uh, VX Works 653, Linksoft 178, and Integrity 178. Uh, we also have different uh, chipsets, different board support packages, different uh, TSSs, and uh, we we have gone and uh, taken software and ported them to the to the others. We've documented lessons learned. Uh, probably some people on the uh, some of the attendees are familiar with the joint common architecture effort. Uh, we actually supported uh, one of the efforts. We uh, help with with a model based acquisition to get uh, data correlation fusion managers from two of our industry partners. Uh, took those, uh, integrated them in, and then uh, did a port to the others and documented any any integration challenges, any integration problems that we had, any data model problems we had. And since we're active in the consortium, we actually fed that back. Uh, through the data model uh, configuration control board and and also through the subcommittees. So y yes, that that effort uh, uh, has been done. It continues to be done, and we're actually expanding from uh, four you know face approach implementations to more where we can gather more information. Okay, Deb, John, Gabriel, would you like to uh, add more to that discussion? Okay, just uh, one quick comment then. Um, if you are familiar with face implementations, resulting inconsistencies, conflicts, and need help figuring out how to correct disconnects, um, you're always welcome to use the PRCR, Problem Report and Change Request tool, that we have uh, to give feedback on your own implementations. If there's an issue with any of the documentation that you're using that is not clear for how to do that, uh, we would encourage you to report um, any issues that you're having with the documentation that's preventing you from successfully uh, building your own face implementation as well. And with that, we're coming up on top of the hour. Uh, unless uh, we have parting words, closing thoughts from each of the panelists, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Gabriel Flores from Northrop Grumman, uh, Jason York representing U.S. Army Amerdeck, uh, Deborah Meradian representing NAVAIR, and John Bowling from uh, Air Force Life Cycle Management Center uh, for speaking with us today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you who joined as participants. Uh, we appreciate your interest as well as your questions and comments. Um, I would encourage you to please download the FACE contract guide, uh, read through it, start using it, get familiar with it. Uh, again, it's available at uh, www.opengroup.org slash FACE slash information, and uh, let us know if we can be of any further assistance to you uh, as you're, you're looking through the contract guide or looking at any of the other uh, FACE documentation. Uh, we're happy, happy to help, and we're here to support. Uh, with that, uh, Gabriel, Jason, Deb, any final words before we depart? Uh, no, nothing for me. Just uh, thank you for uh, listening in, and definitely uh, uh, go download, check out the contract guide, and we'll, we'll, we're available for any further questions or answers uh, that you may have as you uh, explore that document. Okay, thank you, everyone. You have a good afternoon, and um, as soon as the link with the webinar recording is available, we will send that out to all participants. Take care. Bye-bye.